what has otherwise been, you know, semi northeastern kind of weather down here. So hopefully it'll be a sign of things to come. This is today's CME code. I'll, I'll enter it in the chat. Uh, the COVID numbers are starting to look good in the state. The upper two figures of the state, the number of daily cases, the number of deaths in the state still hasn't started to come down, but presumably it's peaking. Uh, the bottom numbers are the Duke Health System, the percent positivity on the left, which has been slowly trending down, thank God, and the daily admissions to uh, the Duke hospitals. I would still say there are probably 150, 160 inpatients with COVID. So even though the numbers are down, the, the burden is still quite high. Uh, some all-stars. So uh, Stacy Bennett and Tracy Tubb helped vaccinate 483 people for COVID at Duke Regional last week. And, you know, I, a bunch of people in the department have uh, volunteered to do that. And uh, I think it's just terrific and fantastic. And thanks to Stacy and Tracy. A uh, little research highlight, Yong Chen was the senior author of a review examining trip channels and oral facial pain. It's a emerging field that was pioneered by Wolfgang and now Yong is, is taken the mantle and run with it. And Ornit Chibafalic was the senior author of a potential Alzheimer's uh, medicine using APOE. And I do suspect that that will become a bigger, bigger area going forward. Uh, Deborah Rose, very proud, was awarded an NIH R38 grant to develop into a physician scientist in the field of memory disorders. We're very proud of Deborah. And uh, this is the our first resident into this program. It's fantastic for her and for us. Uh, I resent my email about donations to the Donald Sanders Resident and Fellow Education Fund. We've had a lot of generous outpouring of folks, uh, but please give it a consideration. As I mentioned before, all donations will be matched by a generous benefactor and by the department. So it's a, a three to one. You can't get a better deal than that. All right, today's case is going to be uh, presented by Steve Gangloff. I wanna thank all the residents who presented cases for the first half of the year. I, I know it's incredibly highly uh, thought of by the faculty and the residents. And for the second half of the year, we're going to have uh, fellows from different divisions and sometimes a, a junior faculty. So Steve, why don't you take it away and I'll stop the share. All right, great. Thank you so much. Everyone can see my screen all right? Yep. Okay, thank you so much everyone for sharing uh, time on this virtual podium with me today. My name is Steve Gangoff. I'm one of the CMP Epilepsy Fellows. And today I'm going to be talking about intractable epilepsy, so what next? And I wanna talk about this topic, not because it's a rare uh, case, but because it's a case that uses a lot of concepts and topics that unless you're an epileptologist, uh, might be rare to you or something that you don't usually talk about with patients or see very often. Okay, uh, so this is an actual photo of me from residency. And uh, believe it or not, there are a lot more medications out there besides Capra and the treatment of epilepsy. But the thing that we find so interesting with data and research in this area is that despite having dozens and dozens of epilepsy medicines available, we tend to see a pretty similar trend when we start to use more than one medication. So this is from a seminal paper by Kwan and Brody. And it shows that when you start to add additional medications uh, in the treatment of epilepsy, we see this trend. So for the first medication you try, about 47 people, 47% uh, of people are going to uh, uh, have response and reach seizure freedom. But then when you add a second medication, you only add an additional 13%. And then with a third medication, you get another 4%. And then the percentages continue to go down from there. So that what that tells us is that as we add additional medications, our percent likelihood that we're going to create seizure freedom in this patient it declines. And so for that reason and for other, uh, and also based on other studies and data, we've come to some definitions and um, concepts in epilepsy. And one is the intractable epilepsy. So the typical definition that we use is when someone has, um, has been on full doses 
of uh, full therapeutic doses of at least two medications and not reach seizure freedom. And we can say that that person is intractable. And the reason that definition is important is because we, at that point, should start to at least consider talking to these patients about other options beyond medications. Now, as you have probably seen in uh, patients that you've seen, a lot of times we'll have patients that are on five, six, seven, eight medications before we start to have these conversations about other options. And really what the data shows us and what, what the guidelines suggest is that we should have these conversations a bit sooner. And the reason for that is uh, they're um, based on the data that I showed. And then also that there are a lot of other options out there for that treatment. So what I'm going to do here is this is kind of a, a cheat sheet, really quick summary of the available, the, the major available options that we have beyond medications. For the non-surgical side of things, we have the ketogenic diet which is, um, I'm sure you've heard of. Uh, unfortunately for uh, this, we don't have a lot of data on the ketogenic diet in all forms of epilepsy. Most of the data is in uh, epilepsy in children and certain types of epilepsy. And the other issue with the ketogenic diet is that it can be very hard to adhere to. So for that reason, it's um, a lot of times, it's not the first thing we go to after medications. It's usually something that we consider maybe a third line, um, but a lot of people do consider that an option after you've tried multiple medications as another option moving forward. But the focus of this talk is gonna be on these surgical options. So the first one is surgical resection. I'm gonna give kind of some um, buzzwords here in blue on the side of how to remember when these options are appropriate for which patients. So surgical resection or ablation is pretty much our gold standard for treatment of epilepsy when it is appropriate and when the patient's a candidate because it can be curative. And what this means is if someone has a, a structural lesion, typically a single structural lesion, then you can, and if you can identify that the seizures are coming from that area, an appropriate approach would be to do a surgical resection on that focal area. So it's best when someone has either one or potentially a couple small uh, focus, foci from which the seizures are coming that you can resect. So this is a picture of someone with tuberous sclerosis who has tubers. Now, although this person has more than one lesion, if we could identify that all, or at least the vast majority of patient seizures were coming from this lesion, for example, in this area, then it would be reasonable to consider a surgical resection of that uh, area to reduce uh, to seizure burden. And if someone had a singular lesion, it's very possible that resection of that area could uh, be curative from a seizure standpoint. Other options that we start to think about, if someone has uh, a lot of seizures and, and they're all coming from a singular hemisphere, some, something like a hemispherectomy can be considered. Now, obviously this is something that we would do um, as kind of a, for someone who has a very severe epilepsy and having a lot of seizures that's very debilitating, but um, potentially you can either do a true hemispherectomy where you remove the hemisphere that is uh, uh, causing seizure, or you can do it what's called a functional hemispherectomy where you sever the, um, the connections between the two hemispheres to stop the propagation of seizures from one side to the other side. This isn't done as often, but it is done sometimes in people with certain types of epilepsy. What I'm gonna talk about uh, a little bit more is something that you might not have heard of uh, before, which are, are devices. So the first one is responsive neurostimulation. This is something you wanna consider if someone has one or two seizure foci and potentially, uh, and, and perhaps maybe they aren't a surgical resection candidate, they don't have a clear mass lesion that can be removed, or they're just not a candidate for surgery, you can do, um, or, or for a, a, a resection, resective surgery, you can do a implantation of a device. RNS is a device that's planted under the skin, and uh, two wires are sent into the brain, into uh, one or two lo loci um, from which you can identify seizures are coming from, and it can use electrical stimulation to try to reduce seizure burden. One thing to note is that these first two that I talked about uh, typically can be curative um, in a lot of patients, whereas the next three that I talk about, RNSV and SDBS, are, are more likely to cause a seizure reduction than a seizure cure, um, and typically can reduce the burden by a lot and can be very helpful for patients, but a lot of times we must tell patients that they, these devices aren't likely to cause a 100% response and you're not going to need medications again and things like that, but they're still very helpful. So uh, the RNS is in that population where we have one to two uh, seizure foci that we want to address. The next is for someone who has either more than one foci or, uh, or we can identify a foci. So they have, when we do testing and we try to do localization, they have their 
uh, seizure burden coming from multiple areas. Um, and this is a device that's been placed. It's actually not a brain surgery. The device is placed under the skin and the chest and a wire is run to the vagus nerve and stimulates that. And through sending electrical activity uh, retrograde, you can actually decrease the amount of seizures and kind of uh, a tamponade that, that uh, seizure threshold. And it works kind of like a pacemaker where you have continuous electrical activity going all the time, but you can also send uh, a burst of electrical activity like a defibrillator by using a, um, either an auto detector or by, using a, by swiping a magnet or some sort of uh, a wristband or a card over the device to send an additional impulse if the person's having a seizure in front of you. And this is a really great device for people who don't want uh, brain surgery and also people who have multiple foci where using an RNS or surgical resection just isn't an option. Uh, similarly, you can also consider DBS. Now this is a brain surgery, uh, it's a, a deep brain stimulator but it kind of combines a little bit of the last two that we talked about, an electrode is placed into the deeper structures of the brain and the anterior nucleus of the thalamus, and the device can send electrical activity into the brain to decrease the seizure burden. So the big question that we also often have is we have these patients who are intractable to medications, they've been on multiple medications, and we have to ask ourselves, well, which, which option should we, should we offer to this patient, if anything? And the way we do that is with a lot of various testing, the most important thing, of course, is location, location, location. We needed to identify where are the seizures coming from or where are the majority of seizures coming from so we can see what type of candidate this patient is. One way we do that is with an epilepsy monitoring unit stay where we do a surface uh, scalp electrode measurement to look for like epileptic discharges and seizures to identify focus this way. Now, if you're familiar with EEG, you'll know that scalp EEG has its limitations. It's not as high resolution as some other options. And sometimes it's not enough to simply say that something is coming from the left hemisphere versus the right, or even the temporal lobe. You might need more information than that. So for some patients, the next option is something called intracranial EEG. On the left here in panels A, B, C, and D, this is called grid and strip placement, where uh, the skull is actually removed and um, a grid is placed on the uh, brain itself. And you can measure epileptic discharges that way. Now this is, has a much higher resolution than a scalp EEG and it has a lot less artifact, which is the big benefit there. Um, obviously it's a large surgery to do something like that, but you should keep in mind, this is still a surface uh, measurement. You can also do deeper measurements by doing electrode implantation where you put the electrodes into the actual brain here. So this is showing an electrode implanted and each of these dots is one of the leads on the electrode. You can also do something called ictal interictal spec where you can measure someone uh, with a PET scan, uh, measure their brain before and during a seizure, and then see where the active area is and use that information. And then finally, there's something called MEG, magnetoencephalography, which we don't use here at Duke, um, but there is a machine at Wake Forest and also where I train. And what it does is a, um, a similar concept to EEG, except using magnets, which uh, go at a perpendicular angle, the um, uh, magnetic field to what we do usually read with EEG. So it gets another another angle, another uh, view of the activity. Um, I won't go into that, it's a little complicated. Okay, so I wanted to kind of just touch on those concepts and then show our case, patient case, and then maybe someone in the room potentially uh, could give us an answer of what we should do next for this patient. So this is a 54-year-old right-handed female with complex partial seizures that cause loss of awareness. She actually had a car accident with one of these, and so she's obviously not able to drive, and uh, she has no other medical problems. She's otherwise healthy. And these are occurring multiple times a day. She's been on numerous AEDs in the past. I've listed them here. And they've either not caused, uh, uh, they've either caused too many side effects or they haven't caused resolution of symptoms. And uh, we did an MRI and found that on the left temporal lobe, there is, uh, the area is, there's less area of tissue and also uh, scarring. And we did an EMU stay where we identified some epileptic discharges in the left temporal lobe. So that also uh, corresponds. And then we found a seizure, which if you can see the bracket here, this is where the epileptic discharges start. Again, at the, the temporal area. Now for this, and then here's progression of the seizure moving forward. Now for this patient, it's not simply enough to say left temporal area. We wanna be a little bit more detailed than that. So this is a intracranial monitoring showing uh, the actual discharges here in LMMT, which is a portion, uh, which I'll show in a second, in the left temporal lobe and the propagation of seizure here. So what we do is we take all this information and we can create a brain map 
and identify um, based on where the electrodes are placed. So the, all these pink dots here are the electrodes and their leads and um, the LMMT, which was uh, the most Steve, active. Steve, uh, yeah. how many more slides? Just one more, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we identified that the most active uh, lead is here. And then we we're able to actually resect that with a focal surgery. So uh, this is the last slide here, but it basically shows that um, you're able to use all these technologies to identify exactly where the lesion is, do a very focal resection. This, in this case, it's actually a laser ablation in that area, LMMT. And uh, we're actually able, this was done in October. The patient has been seizure-free now for three months, uh, which is a dramatic reduction in the previous seizure burden. So there's a lot, but I was hoping I was able to show you guys some of the technologies we use and how we can make a dramatic impact on patients uh, with that technology. Thank you very much, Steve. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, can people see my screen? My yes, you can. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's a, a pleasure to introduce Dr. Matt Ehrlich. Matt did his fellowship here at uh, Duke and uh, is currently the director of vascularology at, at uh, Duke Regional Hospital. We're thrilled to have Matt give a talk on socioeconomic influence on EMS use in acute stroke. Think globally, act locally. All right, Matt, I'm turning it over to you. All right, can everybody see my slide? Yeah, we can hear you, yep, we can see it right, now, perfect. yeah. All right, well, first, thanks all for having me. Um, I'm gonna jump right in here. Thanks for giving me a little bit of time to, to, to geek out about epidemiology stroke uh, and uh, some really fun data visualization at the same time. Um, so uh, the title of the talk is Socioeconomic Influence on EMS Use in Acute Stroke. Um, think globally, act locally. Um, I, I toyed with the idea of changing that to check your assumptions, and we're going to go through and, and check a lot of our own right now. Um, just real quick, one disclosure, I do get a little bit of salary support um, from these sources for the Improved Stroke Project. Uh, we'll skip through that for time's sake. Okay, so a little background on uh, why we're talking about this topic. So. Despite the uh, extensions of treatment windows for acute stroke, efficacy of all of our currently available treatments for acute stroke um, are time dependent uh, with earlier treatment resulting in greater likelihood of, of favorable outcomes. And this extends to hemorrhagic stroke as well, uh, where, where interventions are similarly uh, time dependent and critical. So this graph is probably familiar to most of you. Uh, this looks at the odds ratio for a favorable outcome from stroke three months after the event. Uh, and how it's associated with faster Jordan needle times uh, for TPA. And the slope of the curve here shows basically that faster is better. And this, this data is from the original NINDS TPA study. Similarly, there's some uh, recently published data uh, based on Get With The Guidelines. Um, our own uh, Dr. Jian was uh, involved in this one, uh, published in JAMA, uh, which shows that shorter Jordan needle times were not only associated with better short-term outcomes, but with uh, better long-term outcomes, uh, including uh, lower all-cause mortality at one year and uh, lower uh, readmission rates at one year. So what are the barriers that are keeping us from achieving these better outcomes? And we're really talking about two different categories here uh, of barriers or delays in pre-hospital uh, delays or in-hospital delays. So pre-hospital, we're talking about the patient recognizing the symptoms, understanding that you need to call 911 for those symptoms. And then onset to the time that call is made uh, is the first delay. Call to first medical contact or FMC is another one that, uh, that uh, we're very interested in in the, in the pre-hospital stroke world. On-scene duration for the EMS crew and transportation times. And those are all pretty straightforward. In-hospital delays are things you hear us talk about all the time with regards to our metrics. So door-to-code stroke, door-to-CT time, door-to-needle, and for those thrombectomy candidates, door to CTA and door to groin puncture times. 
But you might say, and a lot of patients do, uh, why not just skip all these things here? Uh, you know, I, I can drive into, or my family can drive me into the hospital uh, faster than, than EMS can get here. Um, why wait for EMS? I've got a fast car, I, I can get there faster. You all know I was gonna sneak a car in there somewhere. So why activate EMS? Well, EMS use has been shown to reduce pre-hospital delays, but it's also been uh, shown to be a, a factor for arriving within the TPA treatment window. And probably more importantly is, is uh, that EMS transportation has been shown to reduce the in-hospital delays, including time to emergency room evaluation, time to CT, time to neurologist evaluation, and time to treatment. The time saved is probably through utilization of uh, pre-hospital notification mechanisms and streamlined triage processes in the ED that are afforded to those arriving by EMS rather than private vehicle. Additionally, in the era of thrombectomy, uh, a lot of, uh, and late window thrombectomy ability now, uh, a lot of patients um, might not be getting to the right place. We wanna deliver the right patient to the right level of care and make sure that patients who have a high likelihood of an LVO stroke are, are taken to thrombectomy capable centers. Um, and this is all region specific. So if EMS isn't involved, you, you may not get to the right place and that'll help avoid time costly inter hospital transfers. Around the time I transitioned from fellowship to faculty, we were developing this here with Durham County EMS. <laughs> Um, this is a, a protocol that they use to route these high-risk patients to university hospitals specifically. So those with a LAM score of four or greater, or those who are all on anticoagulation and therefore aren't TPA candidates, are preferentially uh, routed directly to university hospital. And they carry this around uh, on a little pad of paper <clears throat> with tear-offs, so they can use this for all their um, presumed stroke patients. As a result of all this, the AHA uh, stroke guidelines clearly list activating 911 as a class one strongly recommended guideline. So we should work towards making this happen more often. But in reality, we've known all that for a number of years and EMS use rates uh, remain dismally low. So across multiple studies in varying parts of the US and with national data, as you can see here, um, stroke patients arrive to the hospital by EMS somewhere between 35 and 65% of the time. There's a lot of educational efforts that have been talked about, uh, and some of these education programs have shown small successes at local levels, but very little of this is published and uh, even less about the durability of that effect. So given the inherent limited resources, uh, time, money, and social capital for any public outreach or camp, uh, education campaign, how do we target these high-risk populations? And high-risk in this case mean those least likely to call 911. So the first is gonna be determining who doesn't call 911 now so you can reach them. And the second is checking your assumptions about who that is. Use your own local data make sure you're not expending resources on some of the lower risk populations. So a lot of prior studies have looked at demographics associated with EMS use, but I was more curious about socioeconomic factors uh, are those playing a bigger role? And that hasn't been looked at as much. So this is just a real simple table that I created when I was researching this subject and lists uh, several of the bigger studies that looked at this question. And you can see many of them look at demographic factors rather than socioeconomic ones. Most of these are regional, a couple use get with the guidelines level national data. But the variability amongst the findings uh, in this available data, uh, again, mostly we're looking at demographic factors, suggests a regional specific or time period specific variation. So it really leads you to believe that uh, stroke service providers need to be reaching out to their communities and figure out what works for them. We know patients with lower socioeconomic status markers are known to be more severely impacted by stroke. And, and this has been um, shown over multiple studies, some listed here. You see higher stroke incidence, greater stroke severity, more post-stroke disability and higher mortality in these populations. So my initial hypothesis was for those patients with lower in lower SES categories, maybe they're less likely to use EMS services, thus accounting for at least some of the greater stroke impact observed in those communities but always check your assumptions. So that leads to our study here where we're looking more locally. So the goal, as I stated, is to evaluate how socioeconomic and demographic and neighborhood level factors play a role in EMS utilization for individuals presenting with acute stroke symptoms in our region in order to identify educational opportunities uh, within these communities. <clears throat> 
Our data came from several sources. Our initial patient population was built using the stroke code logs from University Hospital and Regional Hospital. And uh, this represents about a three and a half year uh, chunk of institutional stroke data. So from these, we uh, were able to get mode of arrival, EMS or private vehicle, last known normal times, ED arrival times, door to imaging times, the usual uh, stroke metrics that we look at and, and collect prospectively on all these patients. The stroke code logs uh, that were used to identify patients are then cross-referenced with uh, EMR records through the deduce query system, which is a, a locally uh, developed tool for, for data extraction from, from Duke Health System records. And that uh, allowed us to pull the, the data you see listed here. We also wanted to look at socioeconomic estimates for these patients. And we did that using US Census and American Community Survey data. Uh, so we use a lot of population-based estimates based on their uh, patients' home locations. So we specifically pulled median household income, education, uh, employment, and uh, English as primary language for some of our markers. Finally, we calculated the uh, AHRQ index. So the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality Socioeconomic Index Score this is a validated index that uses seven uh, economic variables uh, that you can see listed here to calculate an index score um, where the higher the score, the, the higher the estimated socioeconomic status of that, of that individual or that area. Finally, uh, we looked at driving distances for all these patients. So we, we use patients' home addresses to the destination hospitals, either university or regional and got uh, distance and travel times using a Google Maps distance matrix API. <clears throat> so we use the, the patient's home address as the assumed location of stroke, one of the major assumptions we had to make in this. Um, but this tool lets you use the origin and destinations of a large data set and, and calculate not only routes, but uh, using historical traffic conditions to, to calculate time of, of travel. Um, and you're able to do this with, with large data sets through the matrix API. So, for example, if I wanted to leave uh, where I am right now in my clinic uh, and go to the racetrack today at 5.08 p.m. when I'm done, uh, I can calculate based on historical traffic data conditions uh, what that's gonna take to do. So here's what this looked like. Um, initial data set, uh, we pulled 1,871 stroke code encounters, and then we excluded patients who were under 18. We excluded in-house codes, patients we couldn't get mode of arrival data, and those patients who were over 50 miles away or only had a PO box address uh, for obvious reasons. We did have uh, some patients who had multiple encounters within that data set, and we used only the first chronological uh, presentation for those patients in order to avoid uh, bias. Uh, essentially, the repeat presentations could no longer be considered independent events because all of our stroke patients received stroke education, including instruction to call 911 for stroke symptoms. So our final population was 1,360 uh, stroke encounters. All right, so what does this all look like? So of those 1,360, 977 were university, 383 from regional. Uh, and interestingly, the patients presenting to university used EMS more than those uh, coming to regional uh, by a significant uh, difference. So 72.8 at university and 65.8 at regional. Uh, for an overall, uh, presentation by EMS of 70.8%. So this is higher than previously published na national level data. Um, and while that looks encouraging, it's probably the result of selection methodology used here, uh, using the stroke code activation rather than uh, discharge diagnosis of stroke, which is a more common study methodology for this. Um, so our method is probably more likely to capture those um, uh, mimics, stroke mimics, but less likely to capture those presenting really late uh, for those who, who patients who wouldn't have stroke codes called. Um, some basic demographics in our population, 54.7% female. Here's the racial breakdowns. <clears throat> and uh, mean age was 65. And our median patient level AHRQ uh, socioeconomic index was 50.65. Before we get too far into the, the results, the other fun thing uh, we can do with data of this type and of this size um, is some um, geospatial analysis. So this, uh, one of the first maps we put together here um, is a heat map looking at where our, our patient population comes from. Obviously the, the larger dots represent more patients. 
and, and you can look at where our population uh, lives and, and is likely coming from. Now you can take a similar styled heat map, but break it down by mode of arrival. So here, patients who are arrived by EMS in blue, private vehicle in red. And you could spend significant amount of time drilling down into these maps and, and see where folks are coming from and look for um, some patterns. Or you can split this up by uh, which hospital they presented to and look at geospatial trends that way. So what we're looking at here is just 2015 to 2016 data. Um, obviously this doesn't use the Google Maps uh, road visualization. Uh, you can do that, but it's kind of messy as you get close into the hospital. Here's a similar map for 2016 to 2017. You can see the increased volumes as we start doing more thrombectomies, but you can see where patients are coming from and which hospital they travel to. Or you can get really fancy and look at how things change over time. So this is a rolling three month set of data and you can see visualization of, of temporal trends as well as see which patients who went past university to regional from the South side and vice versa, for example, and get a real interesting look at, at how our patients are arriving to the hospital over time. And it's just fun to watch. All right, so remember we were discussing uh, some background information that we noted those arriving to the ED by EMS got evaluated uh, and treated faster than those arriving by private vehicle. So we checked that assumption held true here at Duke with our own data. First, last known normal to arrival uh, is not significantly different. So you may get yourself to the hospital in the same time as EMS, but not faster. But if you come by EMS, arrival to code stroke is 15 minutes faster. Arrival to CT scan is 14 and a half minutes faster. And door to needle time is up to 17 minutes faster. So this uh, assumption absolutely holds true at Duke and confirms uh, our assumptions and reaffirms our, our need to get um, patients to call 911. And if you recall this graph from before, uh, long-term one-year outcomes after IVTPA, that 17 minutes saved in door to needle time equates to about 5% mortality reduction at one year if you go from 60 minute door to needle to 43 minute. And, and I think, you know, 5%, I think you could argue is, is significant when it comes to mortality. We also looked at mode of arrival by time of day and found higher rates of EMS use uh, during what we call off hours, arbitrarily here is 6 p.m. to 7 a.m. Uh, and particularly high rates of EMS utilization after midnight and before 8 a.m. But despite the really high percentage of EMS use in those late hours, the absolute N is quite small compared to on hours. So it really doesn't equate to significant overall uh, EMS use increases. There was no association between uh, patients' home distance uh, and driving distance to the hospital with EMS use. So it doesn't really seem to matter where you live. The median distance was only about 8.8 .8 miles. And then we looked at some demographic data to start. So uh, on our univariate analysis, there was no association between sex and the rate of EMS use, as you can see here. And this was consistent with a lot of prior works that uh, we reviewed. Uh, though at least a couple others have shown that women, especially white women, were more likely to call EMS. And we'll look at that a little bit more uh, later. Rate of EMS usage was significantly different between age groups, um, pretty strongly, with older, older groups of patients using EMS more frequently. This may be driven by older age groups uh, who are less likely to drive uh, overall uh, and more likely to be coming from a facility. Um, but that's a bit of an assumption and we don't have that level of granularity in this data. Um, the biggest change between categories is actually between the youngest group here under 50 and then and the 50 to 60 year old group, uh, uh, which shows a 10% increase in EMS use overall. So I think that's a major target. We did a regression analysis, which we'll look at later, which essentially shows a 1.4 time uh, increase in EMS likelihood uh, uh, for every 10 year increase in age. Overall, this is pretty consistent with the vast majority of other studies that showed uh, similar trends. All right, race and ethnicity. So uh, as a little bit of a disclaimer, uh, again, since this is retrospective, we're, we're limited to how Duke um, and the census data uh, labels people. Uh, 
unfortunately. Um, so that's that's how it's reflected here. Um, but essentially, um, EMS use between racial groups was also significantly different. Um, in our population, African Americans are actually more likely to use EMS, uh, seventy four point eight percent, followed by Caucasians and then Asians, as you can see here. And those identifying as other, which unfortunately I can't break down any farther, very much less likely to use EMS down at 49%. Um, when looking at the way they break this down with ethnicity being Hispanic or non-Hispanic, we see um, that those identifying as Hispanic were much less likely to use EMS by a, a large margin. Um, the available literature on racial associations with EMS use is really quite variable. And that's one of the reasons we wanted to look at some of this. Um, a, a larger study by Lacey et al. found that non-white patients were significantly less likely to use EMS. Um, and some national level uh, uh, data from Ekandayo et al. showed, showed similar findings. Um, but a lot of other contemporary studies showed no association between race and EMS usage at all. I found only one small study that showed uh, African-Americans are more likely to call 911 like we see in our data here in Durham. So overall, realistically, this suggests a, a, a regional specific factors within communities that are more likely to affect EMS usage than, than just this alone. So I wanted to drill down into this a little bit more. So this is a, a data from a large study of national level get with the guidelines data in 2015 by Makari Greenberger. Again, our own Dr. Jian is involved. Uh, and uh, this shows that white women were the most likely to use EMS. So this is broken down by combinations of uh, sex and, and racial group. <clears throat> so white women are the most uh, at 62%, followed by black women and black men uh, near 58%, and then white men at 57. Finally, uh, similar to our data, uh, Hispanic men were the least likely to use uh, EMS in this comparison. Even if you average white men and women together, uh, you get about 59.5%, which still surpasses the black cohort here. Again. Uh, different than what we see in our, our Durham cohort. Interestingly, those identifying as other male uh, were more likely to call than their female counterparts, um, which is different than all the other categories. Um, and uh, so this seems to suggest there's not only racial differences and sex differences, but some interaction between these two quote unquote variables. And, and this is very obviously likely to be cultural and, and difficult to glean from this kind of data. All right, so now we're gonna look at some more uh, classic socioeconomic type indicators. Um, one of these, and this would debatably be a demographic factor, but I think you could put it in this category is marital status. Um, patients who were single were more likely to use EMS compared to those who were married in our population. Uh, initially, I thought this might be uh, uh, just a result of uh, lack of alternative means of transportation. Um, but I did find a study that showed only 35% of patients who came by EMS cited lack of transportation as their reason for doing that. Um, so that may not be the case. Interestingly, a subgroup analysis of married or partnered people found that partnered men were significantly more likely to arrive to the ED by EMS than partnered women uh, by a good margin, 60 to 70%. That may suggest that men's partners are more likely to call 911 on their behalf. Uh, again, assuming uh, the women have male partners in the majority of patients' cases, that may be that men don't ask for help or directions as the old adage goes, but it also might be that men don't recognize stroke symptoms or don't identify them as an emergency. And these are things that would, would need to be evaluated uh, more prospectively and potentially with qualitative type work. We looked at education next. So patients living in areas uh, with higher average educational attainment um, were less likely to use EMS than those from areas of lower average educational attainment. Again, this is, this is based on um, population-based estimates from our, our um, census data. So we used American community survey data actually for that um, and, and overlaid that on a census block group here. Uh, and on top of that dot matrix of our patient population with red dots being those who use DMS, blue by private vehicle. Um, Obviously it gets a little dense downtown with where the hospitals are, but with higher res images, you can start to kind of tease apart this data uh, and use this geospatial maps to, to target, um, target where you, you might look for educational uh, efforts. Um, and we'll also look at a comparison between a lot of these maps later it is also pretty informative. When it came to employment, um, 
we did not see a, a significant um, association with EMS use. And the same held true for those uh, in areas um, with uh, differences in, in primary English as a primary language. So um, as a caveat though, again, this is population-based estimates. And I'm not sure this is giving you meaningful data on um, individual uh, patients, but it is useful looking at the patient's home neighborhoods, which again would be the most useful information for targeting educational programming, which is the ultimate goal here. We did see EMS use, at EMS use rates uh, varied significantly by median income, demonstrating patients living in areas with lower median income were more likely to use EMS than those living in high income areas. So looking at this here, we see patients from the lowest income quartile uh, EMS utilization of 75.5% compared to 63.2% in the highest income quartile. And that's what this uh, looks like mapped out. Again, the, um, the heat map here is by uh, average income within the census block uh, overlaid by the patients and their mode of arrival, um, EMS in red, private vehicle in blue again. Um, in later analyses, we noted a really high degree of collinearity between education and income. And that's visually apparent in this map uh, compared to the educational map uh, showed previously. Again, we'll look at these side by side in a minute. Next, we looked at the AHRQ index we talked about before. Uh, just as a reminder, um, this is a, a validated index looking at these seven variables where a higher score uh, equates to a higher socioeconomic status. Not surprisingly, the AHRQ index was also shared, associated with EMS use really similarly to income uh, with those in a lower SES index having higher rates of EMS use. Here's that visualized again in a similar, similar way. Uh, again, very similar pattern to our income and education maps. And that's not surprising given uh, how highly corollary these are in our data set. So side by side, looking at this, you can um, start to see these patterns become a little bit more apparent. So the, the top left map here uh, is a map of uh, EMS use percentage by census block. So that's really looking at uh, just the EMS use. And you can see if you squint the kind of inverse uh, relationship to um, your AHRQ index in the top right, uh, education in the bottom left and median income in the bottom right. And in this way, you can kind of geospatially map our highest risk population and start thinking about how you approach these, these patients. Okay, earlier on, I mentioned uh, how we handled some repeat presenters. Um, uh, in our population. So we only kept the first chronological presentation for these patients, which was done to reduce potential bias since uh, it's not really independent event after that um, because we, we teach these patients when they're in hospital about the importance of calling 911 for stroke symptoms. But we did go back and look at these patients. <clears throat> so uh, 63 of these first encounters were by EMS presentation. Of those 51 came back a second time by EMS and 12 came back a second time by private vehicle. 18 patients had their first encounter by private vehicle, and 11 of those came back by EMS with only seven coming back by private vehicle. There were three that had over two presentations in our set for a total of 10 encounters with decidedly mixed EMS use uh, and at least one private vehicle subsequent, enc subsequent encounter. Um, but overall showed a 76.5% uh, second event EMS use rates. Um, so this suggests a trend towards EMS use uh, increase with recurrent events, uh, but only slightly higher than our overall population EMS use rates. So you could argue that our inpatient education had some effect on this, though I, I might also argue that it reflects poorly on that education since it's only a marginal improvement. Um, I think there's probably something to be learned from these patients. And if we could prospectively talk with this group in particular, you could probably learn a lot. Um, some prior studies have shown that a history of stroke or TIA is associated with EMS use, just having that knowledge of stroke as an emergency. And that may be uh, some of this small increase as well. We did, as I mentioned, do a, a logistic regression analysis um, in addition to our univariate uh, data that I showed already. Um, and this had some really interesting results. Uh, so more, most importantly, I wanna focus on what's highlighted right here. Um, 
in the regression model, race was no longer significant except for uh, Hispanic ethnicity, which remains uh, very significant. So instead, the majority of the difference between those that called EMS and those that didn't is actually predicted by our socioeconomic factors, primarily income and employment. You know, if you recall, employment was not significant in the univariate analysis. So this was a little surprising to me as well. Um, you'll notice our EH, AHRQ index and education are not in this model. Uh, and that's primarily due to a really high degree of collinearity between income and employment. Um, so you're, you're kind of double dipping uh, uh, there to use a reference I already used once. Um, we also see that single marital status uh, also remains significant. So income, age, Hispanic ethnicity and single marital status uh, were the ones that seemed to drive EMS utilization after controlling for this. So I think the, the key takeaway and one that's been suggested by at least one other study in the literature is that uh, socioeconomic status has previously been shown to explain a lot of the stroke incidence difference between racial groups. And ours also appears to imply that it explains much of the EMS utilization difference as well. Okay, uh, some limitations. Obviously this is retrospective and cross-referencing data for individual patients across multiple data sources led to a number of exclusions just for missing data. Um, we use stroke code logs to identify the patients. So um, that may bias towards EMS use in general, which I mentioned earlier. So those arriving well beyond TPA or thrown back to meet treatment windows are unlikely to have a stroke code system activated and they therefore wouldn't be included in our data. Um, it's expected that very late presenting patients are probably more likely to come by private vehicle, but I, I can't uh, say that from this data alone. Um, there were several variables that we were interested in that we just weren't able to get data on. Um, stroke severity, uh, pre-stroke disability, and insurance and payer information uh, amongst them. So some prior studies have shown that uh, disability at baseline is associated with higher EMS use, and I think that makes a lot of sense for obvious reasons. And uh, patients with milder symptoms have been shown to less likely to present within thrombolytic treatment uh, windows. Um, the insurance information, you know, a lot of people brought this up as a potential weakness. Again, the end goal here is to target populations for educational uh, uh, outreach and uh, targeting patients by who's under or uninsured is, is just not really a feasible approach for that because it's hard to identify who they are in the population or target them specifically. So we initially hypothesized that a lower socioeconomic uh, status individual would be less likely to activate uh, EMS for stroke-like symptoms due to concerns for cost of service, lack of insurance coverage, or less education about the urgency of stroke. But when we checked our assumptions, that just wasn't the case. In fact, we found those with higher income, higher socioeconomic index scores were the ones who were least likely to activate EMS in our population, um, especially in the highest quartile of each of those. So uh, realistically, the variability from prior studies and the differences in our own data further supports that this kind of analysis really needs to be done for any given region and any different health system. As there's a lot, likely a lot of local factors that modify these results, i.e. all health healthcare systems should check their assumptions about their patient population and better understand the use of their healthcare resources when uh, potential improvements can be made. So, in Durham, white higher income patients are less likely to use EMS. That poses some unique challenges in designing equitable community education programs when we're talking about having uh, you know, limited uh, resources to, to reach out to these populations. And I think this uh, requires a much larger conversation than we're able to do here. Um, and, and one that ideally should involve uh, community leaders and, and partners with a lot of experience in EDI work. Hopefully I haven't given the impression that we're not doing a lot of work to, to reach out to our community on these issues because that's certainly not the case. In fact, our, our stroke programs in all three hospitals and department leadership have put a great deal of time and, and effort into these projects. And I don't want to skip over that in any way. I'm going to show a couple here real quick for, for time uh, considerations. Um, obviously the most fun was when we sponsored a, a Durham Bulls game and got to go out on the field and get game balls. Um, uh, I was actually interviewed on the air by the announcer um, that, that announces the game to talk about stroke and, and be fast uh, to reach more patients. We've got active Facebook and next door marketing campaigns uh, going on right now. And if you look at our fiscal year 19 and 20 outreach uh, by the numbers, 
um, you can see here, uh, we're estimated to have reached uh, 1,330,000 uh, patients in our area. But it remains challenging to reach the right patient populations. So if you break this down, we've, we've reached primarily women and primarily uh, those over the age of 65. Um, one of the targeted ads right now is on the, the, the website Nextdoor. And so you can use these online tools and advertising to do a little bit more customization of who sees them, but still only allows targeting of populations who are using these services. So there's, there's definitely some limitations. All right, I'm gonna stop there. Um, I wanna give big thanks to my collaborators and co-authors listed on the left, our program managers, partners, and supporters uh, at all three hospitals and, and department leadership for supporting this work and our ongoing education efforts. And I'm gonna open things up to questions. Thank you, Matt. So anyone with questions, either um, write your name in the chat or um, put the question there. So uh, Cheryl, are you still out there? Do you wanna ask Matt? The first question. Yes, Matt, excellent talk, thanks. I was just curious if you look at the population or the demographics, race demographics at Duke Hospital itself, do you know what the comparative of people that arrive by EMS overall? Like for, you know, um, in race demographics compared to the stroke and then maybe- Oh, you mean outside of the stroke alone? Yeah, all yeah, stroke outside of stroke alone. I mean, if you just look at the two, I was curious whether you had compared that just to see. Um, I haven't actually. That's a really good question. Um, again, you know, we we our population started from the stroke code logs. Sure. Um, so that's where we built it from. Um, but that's a really good point. I mean, I'm I'm sure that would be uh, a good avenue to spread out from this and work with our ED uh, colleagues on on figuring out if there's variation overall with EMS use. I, I would guess that there is. Um, yeah. You know, if we had a way to, to look at other time sensitive um, disease processes where that would be that would be useful, I think that's uh, I, I would suspect that they they mirror this. But uh, again, check your assumptions, right? So I think that's yeah. a good question. Thanks. Great talk. Thank you, uh, Mary. Do you want to ask your question? Oh, it wasn't really a question, sorry. Um, Matt, it was just gonna be a comment uh, about yeah. that stroke education. I think we had looked at it and there were some concerns that we may not have been very as impactful as we think we are being in the hospital mm -hmm. setting because it's also not the greatest learning environment for patients. Right. But as of right now, as we do the seven day post-discharge phone calls, we're actually now asking specific questions related to the stroke education. Like, did you receive stroke education? What did you think about it? What did you mm -hmm. learn from it? And kind of collect some data from that to kind of see if we need to change that process or change our education materials in the hospital as well. So hopefully we should have that data soon. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, Matt, so um, that was great. My question is, is anybody working on the, the parameters around which a stroke code is called when EMS is involved. You know, from being at resident conferences, it just seems that everything's a stroke code. And in the end, that's going to hurt the field more than help it. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of debate around that. And it's, uh, you know, very hospital specific based on the resources available. Um, you know, at least, so it's, it's hard with some, we have a lot of EMS agencies that bring these patients and they all do things a little bit differently and some are harder to reach out to than others. Durham County has, has very clear um, processes and guidelines. And, and part of that little tear off sheet that I showed at one point is, is identifying, is this a patient I should, should call in advance? Hey, I think I have a stroke patient. So they use some of these scales to identify those patients and call in advance. So those patients certainly should be stroke coded uh, if they're within the windows. Um, as our treatment windows have been extended out to 24 hours in some cases for some of these LVO patients, uh, we've been battling with this question uh, for a long time. And, and certainly uh, Dr. Fang can speak to, to some of what they've, they've done at university. Um, for us at regional, at least where we're a little bit more resource limited, um, I've worked really closely with the ED teams so that they have some kind of guideline on, on which of these patients is it worth calling a, a late window code on and which it isn't. Um, to keep our, our telestroke providers from, from killing me in the middle of the night when they're getting called. Um, 
but yeah, it's it's a tough question because you're right. I mean, at some point there's some some level of burnout. The the advantage at university is you've got um, your residents who are very skilled and uh, they're 24 seven to, to help evaluate these patients for the ED, which is already overrun with other things. Hey, Rich, I have a question for Matt. Yeah, well, Carl. Hey, Matt, uh, great job. I really like the data. Thanks, thank you. That, that, that's unbelievable. Um, you know, I think the data just kind of suggests what I kind of suspect in EMS, calling EMS in, in Durham, you know, population is now very dense. Um, doesn't really get it to the hospital faster than just drive by yourself, but it really kind of triggers system. You can treat it a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. um, but I was a little surprised actually lead it to 5% or 6%. I don't remember the number actual reduction in, in, in mortality. As you probably know, you know, there's a several stroke mobile units study. They all actually lead to reduction door to needle time or, or whatever, just uh, the strong political time as you buy 30 or more time, but actually they didn't really lead to the, you know, uh, changes on the MIS. Right. Uh, um, so how are your comments actually that was a little changes actually lead to 5% of mortality reduction. I'm just not well, sure. It's, yeah, I mean, it's certainly an extrapolation. Um, we'll pull this back up. So it's, you know, looking at this get with the guidelines data. <clears throat> now I can't find the slide. There it was in the beginning, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But anyway, you can um, just. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, they, they showed over a, a year. And, and if you look, you know, a lot of that difference starts early and then it's just kind of, uh, you know, a durable benefit that starts early. Um, but, uh, you know, they, they, their data was fairly convincing that, you know, those uh, who were treated faster had a slight mortality and readmission uh, uh, benefit. Um, you know, it, it may be the case of diminishing returns, right? So, at some point, if that that door to needle or that door to onset, uh, uh, sorry, that onset to needle time drops significantly, you know, perhaps there's just a diminishing return in, in what that looks like in a long term benefit. Um, so, you know, if we get our our door to needle, you know, down under 45 minutes, we're 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 doing them a service. But if you're treating them at their door front with a mobile mobile uh, stroke unit, perhaps that little bit of a time difference doesn't actually have a a big enough impact that is actually measurable uh, in the long run. I don't know. Yeah, it's a good question. All right, uh, Mark, did you want to uh, make the last uh, question? Well, I was just going to say it, it sounded like one of the big uh, accomplishments of EMS is that the ED knows the person is coming. So it might actually be helpful to even have some kind of stroke code number that people can call, you know, if we publish it widely, if they're coming by private vehicle, they call the ED and say, I'm bringing so-and-so in with a stroke. Obviously, the diagnostic acumen won't be as good before they get there, but it, it, it might reduce time to all those important, uh, you know, landmarks, uh, if, if at least we knew. Yeah, that's a, that's a point well taken. Um, yeah, as, uh, Shree said in the in the notes here, everyone will start calling that number. So that I mean, that's one thing that you know there there have been a lot of studies looking at this too. And and the truth is, um, the general population is really bad at recognizing stroke, um, and uh, and identifying it as stroke. They might say, hey, something's wrong, my leg's not working, but identifying it as stroke is 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 pretty rare. Um, and and so I think that's probably the big barrier there. Um, and so then your education just shifts to helping people identify stroke. Um, which, which is already part of the equation, right? Because they have to recognize it as stroke, recognize it as an emergency, and then call 911. So that's three steps. But yeah, uh, same problems. Yeah, the, nice, right, thing about, the okay. nice thing is about that, Mark, you, know, you call 911, you go through the back door. If you don't call 911, you go through the frontal door, which it takes forever to get in. Yeah. Yeah. All right, everyone. Have a safe week. Thank you.